the Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolution at Brookdale Community College presents its Fall 2012 Lecture Series. In this program, The Monuments Men, with Professor Emeritus of History at Brookdale Community College, Jack Needle. As Hitler was attempting to conquer the Western world, his armies were methodically pillaging the finest art in Europe. The Monuments Men had expertise as museum directors, curators, art scholars, and educators, artists, architects, and archivists. Their job was simple, to save as much of the culture of Europe as they could during World War II. At the lectern to introduce Professor Needle is Paul Zygo, the director of the Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolution at Brookdale Community College. Good evening, everybody. And I really do mean that. Good evening. <laughs> After all that we've been through over these past two weeks, it's a pleasure seeing you all sitting here. In fact, as I've done with my students today, what I asked them to do was please stand up, and I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Please stand up for a moment, if you would. Yeah, please, everyone. Turn to your colleague or your friend, left or right of you, shake their hand or hug them. Because you've all been through, you've all been through a very historic, historic, traumatic experience. And guess what? You're survivors. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, you've all been through a very historic, traumatic experience. I don't think any of us have ever experienced like this within our lifetime. And I do not believe that New Jersey and the Northeast Coast have ever experienced this within its historic times. So we are living in a moment of history. Welcome all aboard. My name is Paul Zygo. I'm the director of the Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolution. And I'm pleased to be here tonight to introduce to you a speaker who helped establish the center some 12 years ago. He also is an individual that helped establish Brookdale's Holocaust Center some 25 years ago. So he's a major contributor to Brookdale, the educational system, as well as Brookdale history. Tonight, he's gonna to be talking about an aspect of World War II which is little known. But I think as you hear him talk about this aspect, you'll become very much interested in what he has to say because he's revealing quite a bit of new history. Much of what he's gonna be revealing has really not been known. In fact, as you're looking at a lot of the things that Jack is putting up on the screen right now, a lot of it might be handwritten because he's still in the process of researching this topic. Hopefully someday in the future he might write a book. What do you think, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Not to put him on the spot. <laughs> All right. And who am I talking about? Well, Professor Emeritus Jack Needle. He's been one of the founding members of the Brookdale History Department, and as mentioned before, has contributed much to its development and the development of two major centers here on campus. He's going to be talking about the monuments men. So without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Meredith, Jack Needle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I didn't know I was being invited to a love-in. Uh, what started off as an official theft from individuals by the Nazis uh, very rapidly turned into theft from nations. Uh, the art, the libraries, the patrimony, the heritage of nations were stolen by the, th by the thousands of truck and railroad cars, and that was shipped off to Greater Germany. This is uh, the extent of Hitler's empire. You can see the uh, yellow are the Axis powers, and the green is the occupied territory, and the, uh, the purple uh, are uh, allies. <clears throat> If you look here, everything to the left was considered by the Nazis as untermenschen territory. Uh, and uh, so uh, whatever happened here happened much more so in this area than in than, than the West. But wherever the Nazis went, they established law. Law was out. Whatever a Gauleiter said, 
whatever a, 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 an SS officer said, that was law. So they started off looting individuals and, and groups, and then, uh, as I said, they attacked nations. Uh, it's estimated that 20%, 20% of Europe's art was looted by Nazis, Hitler minions. That's over, estimated over a trillion dollars. And when you think of the value of, of things, paintings that were worth $100,000 then are worth $45 million now. <clears throat> From ancient times, of course, victors would always claim the spoils of war. The Romans paraded captives and their national icons as trophies. Napoleon enriched France and the Louvre with all kinds of art and loot that he took from nations which he conquered. Uh, even the British, although they were not involved in the war, uh, took the uh, statues from the pe uh, pediment of the Parthenon in Athens under the guise of protecting them. Uh, the so-called Elgin marbles, uh, which reside in the British Museum, uh, are even now uh, under uh, an attempt to be reclaimed, to be reclaimed by the Greek, uh, the Greek government. To prevent the despoilization of a nation's cultural, religion, religious, and aesthetic patrimony, an international coalition attempted to codify laws against such pillage. Article 56 of the Hague Convention of 1907 stated, the property of municipalities that of institutions dedicated to religion, charity, and education, the arts and sciences, even when state property shall be treated as private property. All seizure of, destruction of willful damage done to institutions of this character, historic monuments, works of art and science, is forbidden and should be made the subject of legal proceedings. That's 1907. What was done? Very little. So they added a... <laughs> Uh, protocols uh, at which they thought would help. In 1954, a further convention was signed at the Hague Convention of the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict, and they thought that would give it some force. Today, UNESCO, the UN agency responsible for culture, attempts mediation in such cases. Uh, the more prominent cases usually end up in the courts. In order to have the greatest treasure hunt as uh, the monument, well, I'll change that. But I'll leave it up. Uh, the uh, monuments book uh, calls, uh, you have to have the greatest theft in history. And certainly a trillion dollars, uh, I think, matches that. The greatest theft in history took place during the World War II era. Everything of value of every Jew, and there were six million killed, there were about nine million in, in Europe, and millions of uh, non-Jews in Germany and occupied uh, Europe was confiscated. That territory, that occupied territory, represents 200 million people. Now, anywhere, as I said, in, in the East, anything could be confiscated from anyone. These were untimension. Uh, in the West, they played games a little bit more and they legalized the theft before they took it. They passed laws, uh, either protecting art or whatever, for, for whatever reasons. <clears throat> uh, if, you, if you emigrated from Germany, pre-war Germany, immediately after Hitler came to power, uh, you could only take a minimum amount of money, about $50. Everything else was left. If you had no family, it went to the state. Uh, when Jews were relocated, everything of value in their homes was stolen by the SS Gestapo or the local police. The rest was confiscated. Uh, those that were to be relocated, actually sent to concentration camps, were told to take their most valuable items within, uh, w with them in one suitcase. And upon arrival, everything including the clothing was taken from them. All this was sent back to Germany for turning into money or redistributed. Hundreds of thousands of everyday items, 
such as China, crystal, silver, whatnot, will never be recovered. Homes from mansions to hovels were sold or assigned. In the occupied Eastern Europe, homes left by Jews who fled or were taken to the camps were just reappropriated. As for Nazi theft, it was always covered by illegal laws passed by the Nazis. Um, a DVD documentary, The Rape of Europe, which runs 117 minutes, records that the results are still playing out a half a century after World War II. Uh, these are just some, you know, fairly recent clippings. Um, here's the one from the Times. Museum of Fine Arts has deal on paintings. Museum in Boston uh, had negotiated so that they could keep, um, where is it, uh, of a Van der Neer painting. The uh, person who owned it is dead. There's another one, suit over loot art. And this is uh, the District Court of uh, Washington says the Hungarian Empire cannot uh, have its, uh, uh, its case dismissed. Hung the, um, the government has to repay. Uh, here's one local. This is the, the bottom one. Point in the air to air's pursuit of portrait. This is uh, Rutgers University. Another one of the story of Rutgers. Rutgers returns art stolen by Nazis in Holland in 1940. Here's uh, one on the, the Klimt. And uh, I'm sure some of you know something about the Klimt uh, portrait. $40 million. And let me get rid of all of this. For this one, because this is what we'll be talking about. Paris on trailer. And these are the monument men. Uh, New Schwanstein, so it's probably 1945. Uh, Uh, Paul says it's still going on. I got rid of that. Property lost in the Holocaust is cataloged online. I just want to get the, uh, the number of items. I know it's in here somewhere. At any rate, it includes tax records, voter uh, real estate and land, movable property like art and jewelry, and tangible personal property like stocks, bonds, savings accounts, etc. And uh, somewhere in here, I, I know I had it. Websites in 13 languages. Uh, seems to recall, I think over a million items were on that. Uh, even before the war, the Nazis were confiscating all manner of art from different, for different reasons. One was for profit. Uh, some art was, uh, was confiscated and sold to increase the coffers of the Third Reich. Some art was stolen or forced to be sold at outrageously low prices for personal gain. And some art was taken from artists and owners merely to be destroyed. Um, or, some of you may know about that. Uh, that's the degenerate art. This was an exhibition in, in Houston. How uh, modern art escaped Hitler. All this was, was confiscated because it was against uh, Nazi values. So it was either too modern, it was too intellectual, uh, it made no sense to them. Much of this was destroyed. A lot of it was sold. They understood the value of it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be sold, it, would, it wouldn't be shown in Germany or occupied territory. It was sold outside. Uh, much of what the Nazis did paid for their war. Um, in one night, 1,000 and four oil paintings and sculptures were destroyed 
at the Berlin Fire Department one night. Uh, this happened over and over again. Not that many times, but enough. Uh, and one last fire that they, they had was uh, actually outside the Louvre, where they destroyed over a 1,000 paintings. Uh, we, we all know about the book burnings, uh, the most famous one, uh, 1933, in, uh, at the university in Berlin, outside the uh, Opera Platz. And, uh, but we don't, we don't know that much about the bonfires they had with art. Sorry. Uh, artworks by the thousands were termed degenerate, not fit for viewing because of its negative antisocial message to society. This art had a corrupting effect on, on viewers. Its sources were either Jewish artists, like Chagall, uh, Bolshevik. You know, Jews were naturally Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks were Jews. Uh, or bourgeois capitalists. Uh, Hitler and his cronies deplored modern art. Anything non-representational, anti-war, expressionistic, realistic, experimental, all of that was condemned. And they passed a law against that as well. The, the great painters of the 20th century, Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian, Kokoschka, the Blue Writer School, uh, a German school, were all considered corrupting trash and their work was forbidden. As the Nazis were pushed back and began their retreat uh, in the West, France, Belgium, Italy, they increased their theft on a bolder and more passionate manner. As an example, they stole from, uh, from a Bruges Belgian church the only known Michelangelo statue outside of Italy during the artist's lifetime, a five-foot Madonna and child marble statue which was put on a riverboat and shipped to Germany. And that, we have here. This is the church in Bruges. And this is the Madonna and Child. Did they ever recover? Oh yes, it's there now. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when it was there last year, I can't remember when, whatever it was, last year I think it was. Uh, I asked the guy, I said, oh, is, is, is that the one that was taken by the Nazis? And the guide, who was knowledgeable, very good young man, said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so as I was leaving, I asked someone in the church, said, was that taken by, the, oh yes, that was the one. Um, uh, what countries were they selling stuff that they didn't want to keep? Was it like Switzerland and Sweden? Uh, Switzerland was the banker. Uh, Sweden was, uh, that was a nice transit section uh, for both the Allies and, and, the, and the Germans. They both used that very well. But the, they had, they. They used, what they did was they sold to, um, or, or connived with, art, uh, art sellers, people in the trade who had connections elsewhere. And so they would sell it in, in, the, in the West. They would sell it in the United States and South America and so forth. And then it would make, make those rounds. One of the problems is when they started doing that, they destroyed what's called pro, uh, provenance, the, the, uh, the, uh, the record of who owned what. And there are hundreds of paintings in major institutions, the Metropolitan, the National Museum, everywhere, where the provenance of many paintings are insecure. Now, the, the art... Uh, organization, I can't recall what it is, uh, they, they, they passed the resolution that this stuff should be returned if, if it's not clear where it came from. And so many things have been returned. Uh, the worst desecration of national heritage uh, 
of, of historical and cultural monuments took place in the Nazis' retreat. Mainly through Hitler's orders and the demands of the Nazi hierarchy, the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS destroyed by dynamite and burning many of the palaces, public buildings, and the monuments out of sheer spite after a careful looting. Um, some of you may have heard of this place. It used to be called Leningrad. <laughs> Yeah, St. Petersburg now, but that shows you how long ago this, this book was. Uh, one of the places that I went to uh, was um, Catherine's Palace out in, in Pushkin. That's the way it looks now. World War II was partially destroyed. The interior was almost totally destroyed. No reason. No soldiers were stationed here. No fighting took place here. They just destroyed it out of sheer, sheer spite, maliciousness. Uh, and not only that, uh, when I was in Poland, they told us the same thing had happened there. They also said booby traps. So any of the engineers coming in to fix it would, would, uh, would, would die. There's just another picture. The nice bucolic scene and so forth. Of course, all the, there were no statues there. They were all taken down. Um, if, if you visit the palace today, I, I think it's still true. Uh, I was there, as I say, about, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, whenever, maybe, maybe 20 years ago. Um, there's a picture in each room, and it shows what the Nazis left. And then you look around, it, it's still being uh, uh, rebuilt, it, it painstakingly, and, and it's been 50 years that they've been restoring it. One of the treasures permanently lost from the palace is the Amber Room, now partially restored through photographs. 173 Russian museums were plundered of hundreds of thousands of items. An unfinished catalog of stolen items listed 1,148,908 lost artworks. Now, on their side, the Russian army also had a special arts unit, counterpart to the uh, Allied uh, monument men, except its goal was to steal as much as possible from the defeated Germany as, as it could. This was considered not the spoils of war, but just retribution for what the Nazis had done to the USSR. And I think if you were Russian at that time, you would have agreed with them. Um, it didn't matter to the Russians, however, uh, if the art was originally German or whether it was stolen from the Nazis' victims. The Soviet Union refers to, refused to repatriate any of its booty until its collapse, when subsequent Russian governments returned some of it. Uh, much of it is still there. When Paris was to be evacuated, Hitler himself gave the order that all major buildings and monuments were to be destroyed. The German general in charge of the destruction didn't follow through because of a combination of being intimidated by resistance leaders who told him that he would be treated as a war criminal and possibly because he had a regard for the history and importance of the monuments. Operation Torch was the Allied invasion of North Africa, the first major move in the retaking of occupied territory. The British had been fighting a seesaw battle with the Axis powers in defending Egypt and the Suez Canal when they captured parts of Libya. That part included an ancient city, Leptis Magna, the most complete Roman ruin in Africa. This was the second British occupation of that Leptis Magna. During the first occupation, they paid no attention to the, to the significance of the area, and they ran their trucks and their tanks right through it. When the Italians retook Leptis Mag, and this is the, after the first time the British were there, they unleashed a vicious propaganda effort on how the British had destroyed one of, the, one of Western civilization's great archeological sites. Of course, it was a great distortion because the damage had been done a thousand years before. 
But the Italian photographs of broken columns and caved in walls and scenes of desolation proved effective. So the British understood that they've got to be a little more careful about things. This is very early in the war. Uh, in the second British occupation, a solitary soldier who knew the value of the venue successfully initiated the preservation of Leptis Magna. It was the first, but not unnoticed, achievement of what was to be called the Monuments Men. Alfred Rosenberg was one of the chief uh, fabricators, I almost said something else, uh, fabricators of, uh, and, uh, that would be appropriate, uh, of uh, Nazi racial ideas dehumanizing Jews, Russians, Poles, and most of the people of Eastern Europe. When World War II began, Rosenberg was made head of the main Nazi looting organization, the, uh, the Einsatz Reichleiter Rosenberg, Special Purposes Rosenberg, uh, also called for, short for this ERR. Those were the initials. Uh, in a uh, March 20th, 1941 report to Hitler, uh, which stated that his looters had, had sent 25 baggage cars filled with the most valuable paintings, furniture, tapestries, Goldman tapestries, works of artistic craftsmanship and ornaments to New Schwanstein. New Schwanstein is, of course, some of you don't know, maybe some of you have been there. The, the fairy castle, right, the fairy castle. Um, Walt Disney, right, Disneyland's model. Um, and that, that became a, the repository, of which much more later. Uh, it was built by Mad King Ludwig in the mountains outside Munich. Uh, what else is Mad King, Lunic, uh, Mad King Ludwig should be known for? Because we all enjoy it. Oktoberfest. When he was married, that was what they start with. That was the first Oktoberfest, and they continued it. Okay. Um, these treasures came from, quote, now this is the back again to uh, the Rosenberg uh, unit, the ERR. The treasures, the 25 boxcars that were sent to New Schwanstein, they came from ownerless Jewish culture property. Actually, most of it came from the prize collections of the Rothschilds, the Seligmans, the Birheim Vujuns, the Halperns, the Vial Picards, and the Wildenstein. The, the, and certainly none of them were unknown. At that time, the ERR was already cataloging 4,000 individual pieces of the highest quality and artistic value. The, ER, the ERR was then moving to confiscate additional abandoned Jewish art in France. Uh, beside the special train to New, New Schwanstein, the uh, prototype for the is a Disneyland Palace, a special train of two cars containing masterpieces selected by Hermann Goring, himself selected from the Rothschild collection, had already been sent to Munich. So uh, you, you see Nazis double dealing on themselves. Um, Goring is probably next to Hitler, uh, the one who confiscated most of the art, uh, much of the art. <clears throat> Hitler had a grandiose future plans for Linz, uh, the Austrian town in which he had uh, grown to manhood. Here he would build the Führer Museum in which all the great art of Europe will be displayed. He had already begun his collection of stolen art, and he had already begun, uh, some of you may have seen photographs of Hitler with uh, Albert Speer. He had already designed what the, uh, what the museum would look like. They had models of them. Selection of all important art, art would first be made available to Hitler. Next in line would be Reich Marshal Goring, then the head of the looters organization, Alfred Rosenberg. Goering, however, with what he considered a superior taste in art, was already cheating. Much of the French art which was confiscated had been shipped to, Par shipped to Paris, first to Paris, where a small museum, the Jeu de Pont, uh, which is outside of the, uh, the Louvre, right in a corner, uh, 
it means tennis court. It's, it, it doesn't mean, but that's what it was, an indoor tennis court. Um, the Louvre Museum was chosen as a repository. First they would bring it there, then they would send it to the repositories elsewhere. Uh, Goering had visited the Louvre Museum originally an indoor tennis court built by Napoleon III 20 times, each time selecting paintings for his own personal collection. It was in the Jeu de Pomme that one of the great French heroines of the Resistance worked. As an unpaid volunteer at the Little Museum, Rose Vallon was asked by the Resistance to stay on after the occupation to learn as much as possible about the stolen art. Continually risking her life, she cataloged as much of the art as she could. And probably, imp most importantly, she found out the railroad car numbers of the, of the art trains taking the treasures to Germany so that she could relay that information to the Resistance, Resistance could that to, to the Allies, so when they were bombing the railroads and they were doing this constantly, they would not bomb art trains. Um, she also learned of many of the hiding places. This information she eventually turned over to the Monuments Men and the U.S. Army. Uh, Rose Valland, who uh, became, eventually became a curator at the Louvre, uh, was the most decorated French woman of, world, uh, woman of World War II. Rose was a French country girl entranced by French art. Even when not hired by the Louvre, she voluntarily worked at a small museum just outside the Louvre de Pomme, the Jeu de Pomme. When the Nazis occupied France, the Jeu de Pomme became the repository for the ERR, which was confiscating art treasures from the prominent Jewish families and collectors. She was asked to stay on as an art functionary to collect as much information as to what the Germans were doing. During four years of spying, Rose recorded about 20,000 pieces of art which were brought to the Jeu de Pomme uh, by the uh, ERR for sorting. It was a very dangerous assignment because snooping could get her killed. Several times she was accused of spying, but her mouse-like exterior and the befriending of confidant uh, German staff members saved her each time. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the end of the war, when the Nazis were trying to, to cover up everything, you know, in, in the death camps, they, they had uh, the, the pits where they, they burned, they had them dug up to, to, to get rid of whatever evidence they could. They tried to destroy everything. They also tried to destroy witnesses. And so people who were working with Rose at the Jeu de Pomme disappeared. Uh, Rose used the uh, more informed staff, uh, the German staff members, to extort valuable information. She found out the destinations of most of the art shipments. In August 1944, the Nazis rushed to evacuate their massive illegal hall. Incredibly, Rose even secured the numbers of the train and the box guards, which were to take the last train load to Germany. Because of several delays, that train never got far from Paris. Uh, then the Allies were coming in very, very quickly. Um, Rose reported her information to the Resistance, and almost all of the artwork and the treasure were safe of France. A film, many of you have seen it, The Train, featuring Burt Lancaster, was based on this incident. Subsequently, Rose passed on the information of several of the major German and Austrian repositories to Monuments Man, uh, Second Lieutenant James R. Rorimore. The Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Program under the Civil Affairs and Military Government Section of the United States Army was established in 1943. This group of uh, men and women were organized to protect the thousands of historic and cultural monuments from war damage. Approximately 400 men and women of the MFAA were largely art historians and museum personnel from the greatest cultural institutions in the United States, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Art, as well as comparable institutions uh, located, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Europe, constitutions in Europe. 
They eventually uh, tracked, located, and returned five million artistic and cultural items stolen by the Nazis. Such an action is totally unprecedented. Before the United States entered World War II, American individuals and organizations concern, were concerned and began working for the protection of Europe's art and monuments as, uh, as, as war and the Nazi theft threatened them. The director of the uh, Museum of, uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Francis Henry Taylor, went to Washington, D.C. to express these concerns. It was not until June 23, 1943, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of Artistic and Historic Monuments in War Areas. Under its chairman, Supreme Court Justice Owen J. Roberts, the commission then being called the Roberts Commission, provided lists and reports on Europe's cultural treasures to military units of Allied ground troops of what should be protected, as long as it didn't interfere with military operations. One reason for action in 1943 was the absolute domination of the skies by the United States and its allies, particularly because we had invaded Italy in 1943. And as we got closer to Rome and the Vatican, it became essential that uh, you know, careful planning be done. The Roberts Commission, which established the monuments, fine arts, and archives units within the Allied armies, also aided in restitution of Nazi looted art to rightful owners and promoted public awareness of the extent of the Nazi looting. By 1943, the Allies, and this is what I was saying before, extended the distance of their bombing runs. The introduction of the P-51 fighter, a long-range pursuit ship, and equal to the best planes the Germans had, allowed fighter escort to go deep into Allied, into Germany and, uh, and Italy, uh, accompanying the, uh, the, the big bombers, the B-17s and B-29s, the Lancasters, and so forth. Realizing that uh, damage to churches and historical buildings by what is now known as collateral damage, President Roosevelt ordered that all care be taken in air and, uh, and artillery bombardments. Although the United States Air Force had propagandized that with the possession of the Norden bomb site, it, was, uh, it enabled it to pinpoint a target. How many of you were in the Air Force in World War II? Uh, or, I guess, do you remember the Norden Berm bomb site? Uh, yeah. There you go, right. I could, and I, had, I got into a little bit of a discussion. I was teaching a, a World War II course, or maybe, just, maybe it was just an American history, I don't know. And one of the uh, students was a bombardier. <laughs> and he said, I could put that in a pickle barrel. <laughs> The only problem with that is the same when you put in the pickle barrel in Napa Valley. What we're calling the Central Valley of California because the US Strategic Bombing Survey pointed out that a bomb was considered a hidden target that was two miles of trajectory. Right, 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 right. That, that, because you, you don't know about the variance of wind and so although the bomb is the, the bomb site is supposed to correct all those things, it's an early computer, uh, you can't see through clouds. So uh, at any rate. By the turning point of the war, carpet bombing was the tactic used by the massive air raids, which included 1,000 plane raids. How were you going to pinpoint with 1,000 planes? What you did is you just dropped your bombs as you went along, and it's a row here, a row there, a row there, a row there. Devastated. Um, as the Allies advanced up the boot of Italy toward Rome and its, uh, its huge numbers of historical monuments and buildings, and particularly the territory of the Vatican and St. Peter's, it was imperative that careful planning to protect these monuments had to be implemented. A direct order came from FDR to spare all cultural uh, treasures. General Eisenhower personally forbade any looting, destruction, or untoward usage such as billeting, storage, etc., of significant historic buildings. He ordered his armies to render as much assistance as possible to the monuments men. This was the first time in history an army attempted to fight a war and at the same time 
mitigate damage to cultural monuments and property. British Lieutenant Colonel Sir Leonard Woolley, a monuments man officer, wrote, prior to this war, no army had thought of protecting the monuments of the country in which and with which it was at war. And there was no precedent to follow. All this was changed by a general order issued by Supreme Commander-in-Chief Eisenhower just before he left Algiers, before we even went into Europe. An order accompanied by a personal letter to all commanders, quote, the good name of the army depended in great measure on the respect which it showed to the art heritage of the modern world. A tiny number of monument, uh, monument men working without supervision or written guidance proceeded on their own training and instincts to save the designated monuments. It had never happened before. Who are you going to follow? What was the precedent? Who were the authorities? They had to make it up as they went along. And as, as Paul wrote in the introduction to this uh, tonight, they got no, no, no material support. There was none to give. They didn't even get typewriters, uh, let, let alone some of the type. Uh, although under the uh, support of Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, SHAFE, the monument, meant, the monument used their intelligence, wit, and persuasion to get field officers and the men to cooperate in F MAFF's goals. Um, many of these men, and, and you, you, you read that if you read the monuments, uh, <laughs> somehow or other commandeered jeeps and drove them all over the place through different lines, different army lines, and so forth, uh, all using the, their own motivation. Several months after D-Day, there were fewer than a dozen monument men in Normandy. A dozen men, hundreds of thousands of artifacts. As an example of monument assistance, however, to battle planning, Allied troops relied on aerial photographs taken by MFAA men, uh, which had monuments of cultural importance marked so that pilots and bombardiers could avoid damaging such sites. When, monument, when monuments were damaged, monument men assessed the damages and began preventive first aid uh, to assist in the eventual restoration. Some of the monuments men called Venus fixes, but <coughs> excuse me, by their fellow soldiers, uh, referring to the armless Venus de Milo, stayed in Europe for, re for working on restitution of property six years after the hostilities ended. Um, and wh where's the people? Yes, you want to mention your, your friend, the Marius? Well, uh, can, can you hear him? Maybe I'm just a gentleman who uh, had a career as an art historian, uh, was sent to repatriate uh, Hitler's cache of, uh, of art. Right. And uh, what year was it? Uh, I think 1946. And so it's after 1946. the war. Most of the men who were monument men, or women who were monument uh, men, men, were after the war. During the war, very, very few actually uh, were, were working doing this. Uh, once again, the efficiency and, uh, <laughs> that, that's quotes because it's ironic, the efficiency and future planning of the Nazi regime's uh, chief failure was never thinking of retreat or defeat. As the Allies began to pound Germany from the air, museum and library officials considered moving objects to safer places. Logical. Unfortunately for them, any such suggestion smacked of defeatism, a crime punishable by death. So you say, well, I want to move this to save it. Oops, defeatism. Um, by 1943, however, Hitler became anxious about his art treasures for the Fuhrer Museum. The Altasai uh, salt mine uh, was the major site of several requisitions by Hitler to store some of the artworks 
stolen throughout the uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. From May 1944 to April 45, so that's just over a year, the, which, uh, by the way, 45 is the month that, uh, April 45, that's when Hitler commits suicide. More than 1,687 paintings arrived from the Fuhrer's office in Munich. And that's just to one site. The Ghent altarpiece was transferred there from New Schwanstein. Michelangelo's Bruges Madonna arrived in 1944. Preparation for storing Nazi loot began in earnest in 1944, very late, because the Allies were pounding Germany by this time. More than 1,000 sites were chosen covering an area of over 100,000 square miles. 1,000 sites where things were, art was supposed to be hidden, was going to be hidden. Several salt mines, had been, uh, which had been worked since before medieval times, were on levels that ran more than 2,000 feet, some even deeper, and extended for as much as 35 miles, tunnels going all over. Some mines had over 150 tunnels in them. Uh, an F, uh, MFAA man, James Roramore, mentioned before, pretty much accidentally discovered the Heilbronn salt mine, which contained 40,000 cases of artworks. A similar situation in Merkers uh, happened when um, an MP stopped uh, two displaced persons uh, because they were out after curfew. And... The, the two women were questioned about being out after curfew. The driver inquired about some slashes that he saw on a hillside. One of the women pointed to the hill and said, or, the French word for gold, then expanded, lingo d'or, gold bars. When two monuments men arrived two days later, the entrance was guarded by, by several groups of soldiers, American soldiers, and anti-aircraft guns. More than 100 men were detailed for the, for the duty. As they continued to pass more and more inspe inspection and sentry posts, they decided that at least half a battalion, at least 200 men, were posted there. An old wooden elevator took them down 2,500 feet, almost half a mile. Uh, I'm only going uh, to mention you know, in, in uh, some short biography, just two of the monuments men. Although there were several prominent men in the monument men, MFAA, and its creators, the most recognizable was Lincoln Kirstein. Born to a wealthy Boston, a Jewish Boston family, Kirstein was the son of the president of Filene's department store. Many of you shop Filene's basement. What an experience. Gone forever. Uh, at Harvard, he schooled with Varian Fry. Some of you took Holocaust courses, know what Varian Fry is. Uh, Varian Fry was to be his future brother-in-law and one of the first heroes of the Holocaust. Fry was responsible for saving thousands of lives, including uh, internationally known artists and intellectuals. Among the latter were Hannah Arendt, Jean Arp, Marc Chagall, Jacques Lipschitz, Marc, uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, Arthur Kessler, and that's just to name a few. In 1948, along with George Balanchine, he founded the New York uh, City Ballet. Kirstein was one of the most multi-talented cultural icons in the United States, working in ballet, film, literature, theater, painting, sculpture, and photography. In 1984, President Reagan presented Kirstein with the Presidential Medal of, of Freedom for his contribution to the arts. Okay. Okay. Uh, as the uh, men, the two monuments men continued to pass more and more inspection sentry posts, they decided as a, uh, uh, there, was, there was at least half a battalion there. <clears throat> An old uh, wooden elevator took them down 2,100 feet almost half a mile. 
And for this, let me go. The, eva- the elevator opened into a scene out of Dante's Infermi, Infer- uh, Inferno. Darkness, shadows, men running in every direction, steam, water, wires, sprawling insect like metal uh, equipment, officers barking order, and every echo sounding, sounding over and over again uh, off the stone. The lights, at least the ones operational, threw deformed images on the wall and revealed layers of white rime on the, on the necks and arms of most of the men. Hoses were being used to spray down men and equipment, and the water was collecting in slushy puddles on the floor. Within seconds, it seemed, Kirstein was wet from the humidity. He reached up to, to wipe his brow, then massage his aching throat. It's the mineral water salts in the walls, someone said, handing him a rag. Take this to cover your nose. Use it to wipe down your boots when you're back up top. That salt water will eat through the leather in a day. They passed more soldiers on guard in a group hauling away a big pile of paper currency that was dumped near the elevator. Nazi bank officials had tried to evacuate the currency the week before, but it was Easter Sunday and no one was on duty at the train station. Beyond the currency was a sandbagged artillery emplacement manned by a couple of silent GIs and flak helmets. Beyond them was a great steel bank vault door. Apparently nobody had a key because they had blasted a hole in the three-foot thick wall that surrounded it. Captain Posey and Leonard Kirstein crawled through the opening. The first thing they saw was an American officer getting his picture taken. In his hands was a helmet overflowing with gold coins. Behind him was room eight, the great Nazi treasure room. Lincoln Kirsten stood up. Above him, the massive stone ceiling gleamed with a reflection of 100 lights. He estimated 150 feet long, at least, without a single support column, and another 75 feet across. How high? Maybe 20 feet. Beneath the lights ran a railroad track. A few carts were down the far end of the room, being loaded with boxes. Posey thought the rows of boxes looked short and unimpressive, and then he realized it was all perspective. Each box was taller than the soldier loading it. In front of the boxes, covered most of the floor, were thousands of bags. They were all identical, plain brown, about the size of a loaf of bread, and tied off at the top. They were piled four high and five across, 20 rows per section with a footpath between each. Kirstein tried to count the sections, but it was impossible. The, large, the last section was so far away he couldn't see the paths of the bags. They just looked like dots in the distance. And each one of those bags, all 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 of them, was filled with gold. The artwork stored in a nearby room was mostly painting. Some were boxed, some were marked uh, in marked containers. Others were wrapped only in brown paper. A large number were stacked upright in wooden holding pens, like posters at a five and dime. Kirstein flipped, flipped through them. A lovely Caspar David, David uh, uh, Friedrich painting of a distant schooner. Uh, Friedrich is an important German painter. Uh, of a distant schooner. Had a nasty, nasty rip, but uh, appeared uh, unharmed otherwise. Not much considering, said Posey. Oh, that's not all, the passing officer said with a laugh. There are miles of tunnels down here. And so it went on and on and on. Let me take that one out. <clears throat> All to see Austria was the result of more than 2,000 years of exploitation of salt buried beneath the ground beneath the... Salt was one of the foundations of civilization. Primarily salt was not uh, for flavoring, but for preserving foods. The Visigoths of the region were dependent on salt. Roman soldiers were paid in salt at times. Altersee, high in the Mile High Alps, was first violated by tracked vehicles and an endless line of trucks coming over the treetop level snow to deliver the first art treasures to be hidden against Allied air raids in 1943. Soon, the mine at Altersee was requisitioned by Adolf Hitler to protect his mostly stolen art, destined to 
he thought eventually uh, to the Führer Museum in, L in Linz. Among the crates of art moved into Aldersey were eight crates belonging to a Nazi gold lighter, however. These eight crates contained a 500 kilogram bomb, about 1,100 pounds of explosive. If the Allies took over the territory, they were to be detonated. Such an action was to be incorporated in Hitler's scorched earth policy, the Nero Decree, to destroy everything and anything that might be of value or benefit the oncoming Allied armies. There were many mines and hiding places to be discovered and treasure to be collected, all against a pressing timeline, for the Americans had captured land that was by treaty at Yalta to be turned over to the Soviet Union, and that included Alta Sea and New Schwanstein, as well as the rocket base and factory at Pinamunda. <clears throat> Nazi propaganda had promoted the cudgel of no surrender to its, to its public and promulgated the final suicidal measure of the Volkssturm, the People's Army, and a final holdout bastion was to be the Alps Redoubt, to be manned by the Werewolf Corps. The first was a poorly trained, poorly equipped civilian army. The last two were merely figures of fertile imagination. There was no uh, Alps Redoubt, and there was very little of a Werewolf Corps. However, General Eisenhower believed the redoubt story, the ruse, and it was a place, he thought, to which Hitler might escape and hold out in that hugely inhospitable landscape for many more months, if not years. So instead of pressing toward Berlin, Patton's desired target, he turned the Third Army south toward Munich. In the Thuringian forest of Germany, a mine in Burton Road was found to house an ammunition dump holding 400,000 tons of explosives. There also was discovered there a relic of Germany's most prized uh, historical relics. Let me go to the book again on this. Now, let me see. George Stout, uh, one of the important monument men, uh, crawled through the wall opening and into the room. Even he, who had been at uh, Saigon and Merkas, never imagined. There was a wide central passage ablaze with light and lined with wooden racks and storage compartments. From the compartments hung 225 flags and banners, all unfurled with decorative effects on the finials. They were German regimental banners dating from the early Prussian Wars to World War I. Near the entrance of the chamber were boxes and paintings, and in the bays, Stout could see carefully arranged tapestries and other direct, uh, de decorative works. In a few of the bays, Stout noticed large caskets, several large caskets. Three were unadorned. One wore a, ru a wreath, red ribbons, and a name, Adolf Hitler. But of course, Hitler wasn't in it. Stout walked into the bay that held the decorated casket. Above him, the flags hung limply, some of the older flags and nets to hold them together. Um, a, a crude label written in red crayon and held on with red with tape read, Frederick Wilhelm Ehr, der Soldatenkönig. Frederick William I, the soldier king, dead since 1940. Then they found the, the coffin of uh, Field Marshal von Hindenburg, the greatest German hero of World War I, and beside him his wife. The fourth coffin contained the remains of Frederick the Great, the son of the soldier king. Where did Hitler get these coffins, and so forth and so on? It's a coronation chamber, Hancock said. They were going to crown Hitler the emperor of Europe, or the world, Stout said. And they, were, they, they went through it, and they, they found other things that were important to the Reich. And then they realized, this isn't a coronation room, Stout said. It's a relic. -y. They were hiding the most precious artifacts of the German military state. This room was intended for Hitler. Uh, it, was intended for the, it wasn't intended for Hitler. 
It was intended for the next Reich so that they could build upon his glory. The Seventh Army was closing in on uh, the fairy castle at uh, Neuschwanstein, but it had not been secured. Racing against time, monuments of man James Roermore could not sit still waiting. Instead, he took a detour to nearby Buxheim and discovered there a monastery filled with uh, Renaissance art. Neuschwanstein lay at the end of a long, treacherous hair hairpin drive through the dense mountains of the German-Austrian border, a per perfect reflection of the course uh, his search had taken him. Uh, uh, Rose Volland had told him. Uh, he had gone to the city of life hoping to find great monuments and uh, buildings. Now he was driving a Red Cross truck through the German countryside, helping to find stuffed into a remote castle one of the largest collections of the masterpieces ever assembled. Had it been moved or worse, destroyed? He wasn't sure. And it was exactly as Rose Volland had said. The American unit that had taken the castle reported uh, no resistance, and the total arms confiscated from the Germans and residents amounted to a couple of shotguns. Thanks to Rose Volant's information and Rorma's efforts, the unit had known the importance of the castle and it had been sealed and placed off limits immediately upon its capture. No one of any rank and had entered the treasure rooms. And so they, uh, they went through that. Um, they, they, they got help from some of the Germans who had some notes about what had been taken. Without them, it would have taken 20 years to identify the agglomeration of loot. Um, a catalog of some 21,000 confiscated uh, items of French tre treasure uh, were saved. Uh, and all to say, a complicated conniving plot by some uh, Nazi functionaries stopped the Gauleiter's uh, plan of detonating his, his eight 5,500 uh, kilogram bombs. Uh, what they'd done was place small explosives, but it, it, it did seal the entrance, the main entrance, and 137 tunnels. What eventually were, were rescued from the Nazi robbers was... Well, they, they did discover the uh, Michelangelo, and then they discovered the, uh, uh, the, Ver, the uh, Vermeer studio, as well as the uh, Rothschilds, Vermeer, the astronomer. The astronomer was the most favorite painting of, of Hitler. That was to be the center of the Fuhrer Reich Museum. It came from the Rothschild family. What they had discovered was 6,577 paintings, 230 drawings and watercolors, 954 prints, 137 pieces of sculpture, 129 pieces of armor, 75 baskets of objects, 484 cases of objects thought to be archives, 78 pieces of furniture, 128, 22 tapestries, 181 case books, 1,200 to 1,700 cases, apparently books are similar, 283 cases, contents completely known, unknown. So that's what they were looking for. <clears throat> Within four days, now they thought that they had a couple of weeks to get this stuff out, but the Russians were moving in in less than a week. Within four, with four days left before Altasee and numerous other repositories were turned over to the Soviet, the monuments men shifted into high gear to face their Herculean task of evacuating as much as they could including the priceless Ghent Belta piece and the, the uh, uh, Bruges Madonna. In a little more than 13 months, monuments uh, man George Stout had discovered, analyzed, and packed tens of thousands of pieces of artwork, including 80 truckloads from Alta Sea alone. Once the treasures were found, it was less than half of the job. And this is, finally, <laughs> this is... Uh, the job. The end of active hostilities was not the end of the monuments men's work. Not by far. 
As the situation in the Alta Sea demonstrated, finding looted Nazi treasures was just the first step of a very long process. The treasures had to be inspected and cataloged, then packed and shipped out of the mines, the castles, the monasteries, or simply holes in the ground where they had been stored. Almost every site contained Nazi archives, which also had to be transported so that researchers could determine where the artwork had come from and who was the rightful owner. The archives inevitably led to the discovery of other repositories, as did interviews with the Nazis now being rounded up by the collapsed German-Austrian state. And almost every day, army units stumbled upon unfathomable treasures hidden in basements, train cars, food caches, and oil barrels. By, 19, by June 4th, less than a month since the hostilities, 170, 175 repositories had been found in U.S. 7th Army territory alone. And the, the MFAA, as was said before, were adding officers and enlisted men as quickly as possible. A vast majority of the almost 350 men and women who served in the multinational force joined after the end of combat. But still only a handful of those mines and castles had been emptied, and every piece that was brought out of a hole had to be taken somewhere. Fortunately, the industrious and insightful James Roramore had managed to secure the most coveted buildings in Munich. The former Nazi headquarters party, uh, uh, Nazi party headquarters complex, and soon thereafter, uh, they, they moved to uh, Marburg University and uh, to Weizsbaden, and these were the major points. James Moore, Moore, Roramore, meanwhile, never stayed in one place long, and soon he was bringing along Harry Etlinger, the German-Jewish-American private from Karlsruhe, who had wandered into his office the day before Germany's surrender as his personal translator. Suddenly, Harry's tour of duty was, at breakness, was as breakneck and interesting as his previous four months of service had been plodding and dull. Uh, who was Harry Ettinger? Uh, Private Harry Ettlinger, U.S. 7th Army, at the time, 1944, was 18 years of age, born in Karlsruhe, Germany, emigrated to Newark, New Jersey. So New Jersey has the last word. A German Jew, Ettlinger fled Nazi persecution in 1938 with his family. Drafted by the Army after graduating high school in Newark in 1944, Private Ettlinger spent much of his tour of duty lost in the Army bureaucracy before finally finding his niche in early May 1945. Harry accompanied Roramore to Birch's Garden. While Roramore dealt with the art treasures in the village, the Reich Marshal wasn't the only high official, Nazi official who had hidden his stolen loot near the former Nazi stronghold. <clears throat> Harry went up the mountain to Hitler's chalet, known as the Berghof. He stood alone in the Fuhrer's living room and stared through the enormous window the glass long gone, out of which Adolf Hitler had so often surveyed his empire. How did it feel for a German Jew, whose friends and relatives had died in the Holocaust, to stand among the conquerors of the hall, in the halls of the defeated dictator? It felt good. The house had been picked over by visiting troops, but Harry managed to scrounge a few epaulets and some paper bearing the lead head of a high SS general. He looked out over Germany, now free, and thought those three simple words, it feels good. So that's just an introduction to the mountain men. And as I say, this story continues on and on. Just watch your local papers, see what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to handle them. Yes? Uh, most of the work that they found in the mines, were they in good condition? Because you were talking about how the salt water alone could have went No, no, because the mines also had the right temperature for preserving it. Uh, so the temperature was important. And they, they <sighs> the Allied bombing destroyed a lot of the machines that were keeping the mines uh, humid, humid, the humidity down. So there were problems of that sort. But most things were easily restored. All that gold that they found in there, that was the profits from the sale of, of the art? No. You, you talked about these bags of gold. No. no, that was the German bank. They, 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 had, they, they wanted to move it to, to save it. 
So it, and all German property went back to Germany that, that the monuments men got. Nothing was confiscated. Jack, did they get most of the art out before the Russians came? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. But, but the Russians, of course, came into other areas. They had, they had lots of stuff. In many respects, uh, Hitler was a neoclassicist in his art taste. And uh, a lot of what he did in terms of looting uh, was not considered to be looting. It was considered to be sequestering to pay for the war. In fact, uh, one time he was asked by the president of the Reichsbank, this war is bankrupting the country. What are we going to do? He says, we have two choices, uh, one or the other. Either we will win this war, and then we will simply extract the cost of this war from the conquered territories, or two, we'll lose, and we have nothing to fear then because we'll all be gone anyway. Right. So it was a very uh, a Weltgang or Niedergang, world power or ruin type oh, sure. of uh, philosophy, yeah. which goes back to the- uh, It was, it was a very theory. evil plot. Uh, the victims paid for the war. Oh, yeah. Well, again, the, everybody does. Uh, if you look at medieval history or even ancient history, uh, every con look at what the Romans did to Carthage. They just obliterated it completely oh, sure. and took everything they wanted. So this goes back to like 2,000 years earlier in terms of its mindset. But, but, but to mention, I, I hope there's a difference in, in the level of civilization between then and, and well, modern times. Not really. Times. Look what happened in Iraq when the... Uh, uh, and fall of Saddam Hussein, well, they started looting yes. museums almost immediately. Right, but uh, uh, you know, the, the playing field isn't quite level here, there, elsewhere. Is there, uh, is there any trace of the, uh, of the works that were destroyed and burned? Any list, uh, any documentation? Who were the artists? I mean, you mentioned some, but and uh, the owners. Well, what they did was they destroyed what they considered degenerate art, uh, asocial, antisocial art. Uh, there probably is no list. I don't, they wouldn't catalog anything they're going to destroy. But uh, they did know some of the work of people who, you know, if it was a, fa a painting that people knew or an artist that people knew, they knew what Picasso had been destroyed then. And then if they des could describe it, they might know which Picasso it was. But when you, when you figure you're having a bonfire and you've got a thousand pieces there, that it's not orderly. You have no idea what's being destroyed. <laughs> OK. Oh, no, there's, there's one, one final thing. That a lot of the artwork before the war was sold through Amsterdam. Yes. And then from Amsterdam, it went to places like Harry Winston in New York. And it was the first city bank, uh, the first national bank, which actually was the would sell it for an exchange. It was stripped back through Switzerland to help finance. Yeah, they, they had networks, right? Yeah, they had and, a network of and, the right, financial and, and and they they were working with uh, reputable people. Oh yeah. So you had thief, disreputable, and then followed through to reputable people. And so the, 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 the provenance of paintings. Became so muddy. Right, absolutely. OK. Any other questions? All right, if not, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Let's give Jack Needle one more round of applause. Okay. Very good, Jack. Very good. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Please have a safe trip back home. We hope you enjoyed this program. For more information on the Center for World War II Studies, visit brookdalecc.edu forward slash pages forward slash 730.asp. This program series is available for sponsorship by corporations and organizations. You can find out more information about sponsorship at bit.ly forward slash content sponsorship. We produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. This program is copyright Lubetkin Communications and all rights are reserved. No reposting or other use of this program may be made without written permission from the copyright owner. For Paul Zygo and everyone at the Brookdale Center for World War II Studies, 
This is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.